was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, the safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted even me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, and welcome to Online Worship with Orange Beach Presbyterian Church. My name is Kim. I'm the pastor here. And what a joy it is that we are gathered together for worship today. Everything that you will need to worship today, that it'll appear on your screen as you need it. The words to the hymns and the responsive readings, uh, the prayers. You won't need a bulletin. You just need a heart for worship. So as we sing together and pray together, uh, hear the voices, not in this sanctuary, but in homes all over the world, as we worship as one body of Christ. We will begin, as always, with our call to worship. We come because we seek our God. Every morning, every day, every evening, every moment, God is with us. We come because we hunger for Christ. Jesus will feed us with hope, will replace our emptiness with grace. We come because we thirst for the Spirit, who fills our yearning for peace, who ends the drought of justice. Let us now go into a time of confession. We'll pray first silently, just a moment of confession between you and God. And then we'll pray together in the prayer found on your screen. Let us pray.
and let us pray together. God of living waters, we confess that we have often turned from you and wandered in our own wilderness of fear and doubt. Our thirst mounts daily, seeking to be quenched by your redeeming love. Yet when that love is offered to us, we again turn away. We have behaved in very unloving ways. We have chosen to ignore those in need or to deal only passively with them. Our hearts are not placed in service to others, but rather in self-serving motives. Heal us, merciful God. Wash us again in the living water. Help us be faithful servants. Amen. The waters of mercy and healing are poured over you. Our hope and assurance rest in God's unfailing love and forgiveness. In this love and forgiveness, we encounter the living God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Before we hear God's written word, let's turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, how we thank you for this morning, for this time gathered together. Gathered not in the same room, but in many different rooms, in many different places, but with one heart, a heart that worships you. We sing the same praises, we pray the same prayers, we come to you as one body of faith, your body, your children gathered together. So we thank you for the technology that makes it possible to worship from afar, to be one congregation, although we are spread out. And today we pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit, as far spread as we are, we can never be so far spread that you cannot reach us, that you cannot gather us up, hold us close, and blow your breath into us. As the Holy Spirit washes over us, as we hear your written word, let us recognize your voice and know your message. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as together we pray how he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. So Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds. 
Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that God seeks. God is spirit, and God's worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of God who sent me and to finish God's work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the story of the Samaritan woman, also known as the woman at the well, is the story we're talking about today. A rather lengthy scripture passage. So much is happening. There's a lot we can pull from here. And all of it speaks to who Jesus is. All of it speaks to our own personal relationships to him as well. He is breaking social norms. He is ministering to this woman. He is revealing who he is. He's revealing who she is. And then she goes and spreads the word so that many more believe. Let's take a look at this passage. This is early in his ministry. He doesn't quite have the crowds that he will come to know. He's returning to Galilee, and he's going through Samaria, which in and of itself is not super common. Many Jews would avoid going into Samaria, even to the point where they would cross the Jordan River to go around and have to cross the Jordan River back again, just so they wouldn't have to walk through. Such was the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. They did not have It's not that they didn't have a good relationship. They didn't have any relationship. The Jews viewed the Samaritans as being unclean because they didn't follow all of the Jewish laws. But Jesus walked straight through. He didn't cross the Jordan River. He didn't try to avoid the town. He went through it. And there was a town in Samaria near the plot of ground where Jacob had given his near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And there was a well there where he stopped. He was tired from the journey, so he sat down and sent his disciples into town to get some food. That makes sense. We've been traveling. We're tired. I'm going to sit and rest. Y'all go on ahead. Get some food. Bring it back. We'll have breakfast together. I love the way this unfolds. It's just such common stuff. We're traveling, we're tired, I want to rest, y'all go get some food. Just everyday stuff. But Jesus is set up here for this important encounter. I think that Jesus does that for all of us. Sometimes it's almost a surprise when we encounter Christ in others in our daily lives when we get a little God wink, as some people call it. But Jesus does this. Jesus is there for these important moments. So he's alone. And the Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Jesus talks to her, which was surprising. Surprising to the fact that she commented about it. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? We've got a lot of social constructs here that are being broken. She is a Samaritan. He is a Jew. We've, we've already talked about that. She's a Samaritan woman. Men and women didn't just talk to each other. They didn't have these kinds of relationships like we have today, where we recognize that men and women, people, can have conversations with one another without it being inappropriate. But back then, men and women didn't just have casual friendships. Men and women didn't sit and chit-chat with one another. But again, Jesus breaks these barriers. She says, why are you talking to me? And he said, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He's saying, if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me. This is reminiscent of John the Baptist. When Jesus came to John the Baptist and said, I need you to baptize me, and he said, you should be baptizing me, right? So here he is. You should be asking me for a drink if you only knew who I am. And of course, this confuses the woman. She has no clue who he is. She says, you don't have anything to draw with. You know, he says, you should have asked me for water. I mean, I can almost hear her laughing. Like, what a fool. How could, why would I ask you for water? You don't even have anything to draw it up from. The well is deep. How are you going to offer me water? Where are you getting this, quote, living water? Are you greater than Jacob who gave us the well? 
Yeah, he is. <laughs> he is greater than Jacob. He does have the living water. And, and as always, Jesus is not speaking as plainly as she might think. Jesus so often says things that have a deeper meaning and a different meaning than its face value. He's not offering to get her a glass of water. He's not offering to, you know, put a bucket down and pull up water from that well. We're about to find this out. Because Jesus says, everyone who drinks this water, the water that comes out of this well, you'll be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. The water I give becomes a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When Jesus gives us that drink, it becomes in us a spring. Let's think about what that means. Okay, we know we're not talking about an actual cup of water. We've established that. Because when you drink a glass of water, you'll be thirsty again, right? If, if you're working outside in the summer and you drink a glass of water, you're gonna be thirsty again pretty quickly. If, if you drink a glass of water you know, with dinner, you may go to bed without having another glass of water, but when you wake up, you're thirsty. The physical act of your body absorbing the water and using the water and expelling the water. Now you need more water. You need more to drink. And when the body doesn't have that water, ooh, you feel terrible. Dehydration is awful. It was one of the things that I dealt with when I had COVID uh, way back in November of 2020. I was so thirsty so 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 thirsty uh, my husband went out and bought a case of water for me so that i could just sit and drink water and not have to be constantly masking up and going in the kitchen and bleaching everything to get a cup out of our faucet he just bought a case and i just drank bottle after bottle of water i was so thirsty and that continued on for months and months and months and even now uh, what two and a half years later I still get dehydrated very easily. I have to be very conscientious of how much water I'm drinking. And when I don't drink enough, I get a horrible headache. I feel awful. All of my energy gets drained. I just, I, I have this feeling of being unwell. So I have to constantly remind myself as I get that feeling, have I had enough water? Am I just, you know, getting dehydrated? You feel terrible if you're dehydrated. And it happens. You have to keep drinking water you have to keep refilling but jesus says you know i'm the living water i am the river of life i am this constant source and you don't get thirsty you know you you don't and even more important what i really think we can take out of this today is what happens when you have the living water the water I give will become in you a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. It's not just you drink a glass of water and now you'll never be thirsty again. It's that water that you take in, the Christ that you take in becomes a spring, a well of water. It's constantly bubbling up. It's constantly refreshing itself. It's constantly making sure that you have no thirst. And when you have that spring of water, you can pour it out to others. As Jesus fills us up from the inside out, we can pour that out to others. And that's exactly what this Samaritan woman does. She says, I'll take this water so that I won't get thirsty. Then I won't have to keep coming to the well and pulling up the water. And, you know, she's traveling alone because she's not a married woman and, you know. And he then plays this little game with her. Go and call your husband and come back. And she's truthful with him. I don't have a husband. He says, I know, you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. He knows who she is. He knows her past. He knows her present. And he knows her future, a future of eternal life. And the fact that he knows this about her further speaks to the fact that he's sitting there having a conversation with him. In this day and age, you don't do that. You don't have this kind of conversation with a Samaritan, 
with a woman, with a woman with this kind of past and this kind of present. But Jesus knows us. He knows our past. He knows who we are. He knows everything that we have done. And he knows who we are and loves us and has conversations with us and offers himself to us no matter what is in our past. Whether we have been on the straight and narrow every minute since we were born or whether we have taken terrible paths, whether we have committed grave sins, if we are here and we are saying, I want this living water, Jesus, who knows us, pours it into us. And this, the fact that he knows her so well, without having ever met her, this turns the light on for her. I can see that you are a prophet. She doesn't quite get it. She's getting there. I can see you're a prophet. She doesn't say you're the Messiah. She doesn't say you're the Christ, the Son of God. She says you're a prophet. And then, you know, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you claim that the place where we have to worship is in Jerusalem. I guess she's calling attention to the fact that Jews and Samaritans were different, culturally different, spiritually different, religiously different people. And he says, you know, a time is coming when you'll worship God not on this mountain, not in Jerusalem. He's starting to fill her in. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The time has come where you don't have to be in Jerusalem to be a true worshiper of God. You don't have to be on that mountain to be a true worshiper of God. And hey, wherever you're watching this, you are a true worshiper of God. There is not the requirement to be inside a sanctuary. And you might say, well, then why do we have churches? Well, there is joy in gathering together. There is joy in being in a sanctuary, in having multiple voices being lifted up together. And, you know, I obviously don't worship from home. I worship here in the sanctuary. But when no church was open, or not many churches were open, no church was supposed to be open, back when everything was shut down with COVID, we all worshiped from home. And that was joyful too. There were things I really loved about that. And there are things that I really love about worshiping together. If you, right now, you are watching this, you are not in the sanctuary. And yet you are a true worshiper of God. For whatever reason that you're not in a sanctuary. Maybe you were in a sanctuary this morning and you're watching this this afternoon. Maybe you are, you know, not going out into public just yet. COVID is not over. Let's not forget that, please. Or maybe you are not feeling well and don't want to come and risk getting others sick. Or maybe you are one of our winter visitors and you've already made it back home safely and you still want to come and worship with your Orange Beach family. All of these reasons are valid and good. And not a single one of us is in Jerusalem. And yet we are true worshipers of God, worshiping in spirit and truth. And the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. I know Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Okay, she's getting there. She's almost there. She's practically there. And then Jesus tells her, I'm him. I'm the Messiah. You know the Messiah is coming? It's me. And just then, as he's revealing this to her, the disciples come back. They've gotten some breakfast. They come back, and they're pretty surprised to find him talking to this woman. Again, breaking all the cultural norms. And again, this is still relatively early in his ministry, so the disciples haven't quite gotten accustomed to the ways that Jesus shakes everything up. So they come back, they're surprised to find him, but nobody asks questions. They don't say, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? They just observe. So she leaves her water jar, the very thing she went to the well for, perhaps she knows she's got the living water. She leaves the water jar, she goes back to the town and she says to the people, you're not gonna believe this. You've got to come see this man. 
He knows everything I ever did. Guess what? Probably so does the town. You don't have five husbands and then a man who's not your husband without the town chit-chatting about it, right? I mean, sad, but true. So she says, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She's had this encounter with him. And he's told her I'm the Christ. But she's still questioning, understandably. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and they made their way toward him. And the conversation continues. He tells his disciples, I have food to eat that you know nothing about, and my food is doing God's work. And the Samaritans come from town, and they believe in him because of the woman's testimony. And they urge him to stay, and so he did stay. And many more became believers. And they said, not only did you tell us, we don't just believe because of what you said, now we know for ourselves that this is the Christ. Wow, what a lot, what a lot. He encounters this woman, she figures out who he is, knowing that he knows who she is and she's not super proud of it. And then she goes and she shares the good news and more people hear. He's telling his disciples and he's telling this woman that food and water you know, are great for the body, but that's not what sustains us. I'm the living water. I will put a well, a spring inside of you that will bubble up and keep you hydrated, keep you in the living water, keep you with me. Keep me close in your heart and then share it with others. The woman goes and she tells, he tells his disciples, you know, breakfast is great, whatever, but my food is doing God's work. And then you don't get hungry doing God's work. And then the people believe because of her testimony. Where do you see yourself in this story? I mean, I think we're all over the story at different points in our lives. So where are you today in this story? Are you the person who is sort of on the outskirts of society, or at least you feel that way? Are you the person who is still kind of hung up on the sins of your past? And so not really allowing yourself or not feeling like you're worthy to be a part of a church or spreading the gospel or talking to people about your faith story? Are you thirsty? Are you relying on the water and food of the world to keep you sustained when you, keep, when you know good and well that you're going to get thirsty again, you're going to get hungry again? Are the things of the world what's keeping you motivated? Or are you turning to Jesus and allowing Jesus to live within you, to keep you in him and with him, to be a well in you, a spring of water welling up to eternal life? Is your food, is what feeds you, earthly treasures, uh, power, money, success, uh, you know, notability, popularity, or is your food to do the work of God? Is that what feeds you? And who are you telling about all of this? If, if serving God is what feeds you, are you telling others about that so that they can know Jesus too? This is, this, there's so much in this. I want you to sort of dwell on it. Think about it. Go back and reread it again. It's John chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. It's the story of the Samaritan woman, also known as the story of the woman at the well. So you can read about it, you can Google it, you can turn back to the scripture, and you can just say, where am I? Am I at the well? Am I having conversations with Christ? Am I questioning what exactly is going on in my life? Am I allowing God to feed me? Is that is serving God what feeds me? Am I feeling thirsty for something that doesn't quench my thirst? Or am I thirsting for God who never leaves me thirsty? Am I telling people about Jesus? Or if you're not, what opportunities do you have to do that? As are my eyes and my heart open to telling people about God, about my faith story, about Jesus? 
These are all big questions and we all have different answers. So spend some time thinking about that. Jesus sees you. Jesus knows you. All of the good, all of the bad, all of the mistakes, all of the sin, all of the love, all of the servanthood. He knows it all. And he welcomes you and he loves you and he offers himself to you to sustain you in ways that never leave us thirsty, that never leave us hungry. Amen. Let us now pray for and with one another. Gracious God, we have so many blessings. We thank you so much for your son, for the gift of Jesus and all that he does for us and with us and through us and for us. We thank you that he is giving us life, giving us water, giving us food, spiritual food. We thank you for your beauty in creation, for the rains that fall, the winds that blow, the blue skies and the gray, your creation all around us. As we see hummingbirds coming back to the area, as we see flowers blooming, as we deal with the pollen, you're right there. You are in the midst of it all. You're laughing with us and celebrating with us and dancing and running and leaping with us. And we are so thankful. And we are also thankful that you don't just come around for the joys, but you're also there through the sorrows. For we all have concerns we all know people who are sick in mind, in body, or in spirit. And you are present for that journey as well. When we weep, you wipe the tears from our face and you hold us tight as we cry. When we are worried, you remind us that you are with us. When we are angry or frustrated or tempted, you are there. You walk through us every step when we can't walk anymore, you pick us up and carry us. Or you give us a little push when we need to get moving. Or you walk alongside us as we go together through life. So we lift up all of those people who need you, including ourselves. We name to you all of those things which are troubling us. All of the badness and sadness in the world, whether it's natural disasters like terrible earthquakes or whether it's human-made disasters like gun violence or racism, whether it is sickness like COVID or cancers or any of the other myriad illnesses with which we are afflicted, you are there. You call doctors and nurses and counselors. You call pastors and Christian friends to be with us through this journey and help heal us. So we pray for all of the people who are in the work of healing. We pray for our friends and family who offer us love and support. And we pray for opportunities to return that favor to others. Guide us and keep us, sustain us, and give us the words to say and the things to do for the people who need you. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
This concludes our worship service. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be back again next week. I hope to see you there again. But for now, it's time to turn off our computers or our phones, our televisions. However you're watching this worship, worship is over. But it's just beginning as we take it out into the world. So drag this out with you. Turn this worship service inside out so that the love of God does spring up from inside of you. So that people do see the love of Christ in you. This should be very exciting. We should be bold and joyful as we part ways. For we go with God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. Children of the Lord said, Amen.